nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Tell us uh, how unique is this uh, in this uh, agreement? Actually, this wording, nothing is agreed before everything is agreed, we, we meet this wording very often in the Middle East. In last few months and years, I have been, actually a couple of years, I have been watching these uh, negotiations on Middle Eastern weapons of mass destruction free zone. And the same term is over there that nothing is agreed before every detail is in place. So that's not, not new. And I think that it's, at the same time, it indicates how, how the relation between the parties is, because this is to do with the trust. You don't want to give your leverage in before you see that you get something in return. And that's why we have this unfortunate wording over there, which will have an impact to the negotiations. Is this something that you agree, or this is the same understanding you have, that Iran is actually committing to something further than NPT? I don't read it this way. I read it in a very much more simpler way, which is that you know you have rights, but the rights come with the obligations, and the rights, which means that you know you can exercise all your rights, have your peaceful nuclear energy program or peaceful nuclear program, but when you have it, you need to follow the uh, obligations, like uh, obligations which are arising from the safeguards agreement between the IAEA and Iran. So these are the requirements for Iran to fulfill. So I, I don't read it that far as, as you read. So you think everything is still under the uh, premise of the NPT? Yes, that I think is, at the, is the so-called end, end result. But how to get there in between? There might be a period when Iran had to has, has to show more generosity and remove the doubts about the nature of the nuclear program. And that is, I think, is what is going to be discussed now in this new talk, next phase of the talks, which start in February. What are those requirements in between the initial uh, um, stage and the next uh, phase that, uh, as you mentioned, in February they're going to talk about? Yes, this uh, joint plan of action doesn't make any reference to the uh, language which is the United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, it makes a reference to the requirements of those resolutions but without specifying them. And I think that one of the most uh, difficult parts of that is to meet that requirement which the Security Council has put to, the, uh, to Iran to clarify certain issues related to so-called military dimension of the program and ask Iran to be open and discuss these matters with the IAEA, have IAEA access to the certain sites and people and documentation. So I think this is one of the topics which is there in the, in the next phase. There may be some other ones which are related to sanctions and which Iran may want to clarify, but since these have not been made public and clearly speci specified what they are, but I am sure the Security Council resolutions need to be fulfilled. The differences of the reading of the same text by White House and Tehran, is it uh, because of uh, posturing or uh, the text is so vague? Well, I don't think it's a vague. You know, I, I think that people read differently. You know, my father was a lawyer and he says that the law is not how it is written, it is how it is read. And I think that we see this happening here and then also yeah, I think that in uh, various countries people uh, prepare some of the statements also for domestic consumption. So that might be one of the reasons for the differences. And then I think one other one is that we have probably not seen the full text. So that what in, in reality is on those documents. And that may also cause some of the confusion because if you make it the language shorter, so then it may lose some elements which were there originally. When you read this text, you think Iran is right or the U.S.? I don't think that I start to become a judge here, but let, you know, paper is there and let's work from that. The agreement is there. I think this is important. It's not a huge step forward. It's a small but important step. Now they have put up, out their views and now have, they start to iron uh, the final accord. And the, the quicker it comes, the better, I think, for all the parties. It's possible, it's conceivable that Iran and P5 plus one go to the same uh, path that uh, six party talks went. I would not compare this one to the, you know, to 
North Korean case for a number of reasons. Because there are a few things which North Korea was not supposed to do, like this uh, missile tests. While when uh, we look this agreement between P5 plus 1 and Iran, these are pretty much nuclear related issues which are easier to measure. Unless there is some adverse development somewhere else, I don't think that this path, path will come. And I think also negotiating uh, atmosphere when I look, it's perhaps uh, quite a lot of better between Iran and P5 plus 1 than perhaps was there in North Korea. And North Korea had its ups and downs at agreed framework, then monitoring scheme, and then the six party talks and leap day agreement uh, last year. Uh, I don't think, you know, we should start to read too much on those North Korean things. You don't think the this agreement, if it's going to be implemented fully, uh, automatically would replace the UN Security Council resolutions? I don't think so. I, like this will not replace the safeguards agreement. They, they run their own course, but certainly this has an impact on those. So once you see the results coming out, as I said, I'm sure the Security Council will reconsider some of its uh, resolutions and look, take acts accordingly. But the pessimism uh, from Tehran uh, is coming in a, based on the same fact that uh, P5 plus 1 at the end of the day, they're not going to let Iran to have the full enrichment, full uh, fuel cycle. And they're looking at your, actually for the UN Security Council resolution that they ask for stopping the enrichment uh, uh, activities. You know, Security Council resolution doesn't ask Iran to forego enrichment. It only asks Iran to stop the enrichment so that these issues which have been, and concerns which have been raised can be properly addressed. And then when IAEA has done its work, then Security Council will reconsider it. So I don't see a difference here, but that's for sure, as you pointed out, that at the very end, Security Council has to do something. Mm -hmm. So uh, which side are you on? But when John Kerry was saying that this uh, agreement doesn't give Iran the right uh, for enrichment, and Iran said it gives every right uh, for enrichment. Well, maybe somewhere in between, because as a matter of fact, I see there that you know Iran continues to uh, uh, its enrichment. Uh, there are certain uh, slowing down in enrichment program. Uh, there are certain caps in terms of what amounts of nuclear material to be produced, enriched uranium to be produced. There are caps on numbers of centrifuges to be operated. There are some caps related to the introduction of new new types. So it, it appears to me that at this point of time, the P5 plus uh, one ha have agreed that Iran can do enrichment the way it does. Then what will be the end result? I think a third one has to be reasonable and look at what are the real, need, the, the real needs of Iranian nation. And this is for Iranians to think also. I don't think that at the very end, uh, pride is an important thing, but there is also the actual need. And I think that the decision makers in Iran have to strike a balance that, you know, what are the real needs uh, of Iran's economy and then uh, timing of those enrichment activities and methodology, whether to do alone, whether to do with someone else, those all needs to be still sorted out. And I think it's too early to cast the final situation or final decision to iron. Mm. There is a line about the uh, adopting the additional protocol, or ratifying the additional yeah. protocol by the government and the majlis. But it seems to me that Iran is already doing the additional protocol by this type of uh, daily inspections and uh, everything that, uh, that's been given to them. Uh, is this right? I don't think it's quite right. You know, first of all, uh, actually, additional protocol uh, uh, requirements go, go much further than what this agreement is. This is, a, I think, a kind of compromise between the requirements of additional protocol and uh, what Iran was willing at this point of time to do without, you know, getting a problem that now they are really uh, given up and uh, implementing additional protocol. And I give you a, just a couple of examples. Uh, additional protocol has an instrument which is called compl complementary access. And with this complementary access, the IAEA inspectors can also go to the places where centrifuge uh, R&D is done. R&D without nuclear material. So if we look in Iran, 
and the R&D, which was one of the disputed and touchy issues in this agreement. So the R&D is done basically in Natanz, where centrifuges are spinning with uranium hexafluoride. But Iran has some other places where centrifuges are developed, used to be in Kalai Electric in uh, Tehran. This agreement doesn't provide access to that place, since there is no nuclear material. But the additional protocol would let the IAEA go in. Similar thing go with any other activities related to fuel cycle, development of new conversion techniques, development of reactors, etc. So there are a lot of additional items which uh, the IAEA would have an access if additional protocol is fully implemented. And this agreement doesn't provide uh, access to that extent. But in terms of the unannounced um, uh, inspections, that's the right that's been given to IAEA every time. Every day they need, they can just rush into any uh, facilities that's been mentioned, Natanz, Fordue, uh, Iraq, and uh, visit it. Is that right? Yes and no. First of all, it has nothing to do with Arisa protocol. Unannounced inspections have been in safeguards since early 1980s, and they are done basically under the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement. But again, if you read this text, actually this access is not unlimited. There are a lot of restrictions. For example, access to Natas, yes, it tells that IAEA can have access daily to surveillance records, which means to see the cameras, see how they are collecting uh, images. But I read this agreement in such a way that you cannot go anywhere else in Natas. So you cannot go to every building. You can only go to... So it's kind of to, a managed access. Yeah, and, and restricted, more than mani managed. This is restricted because it's restricted only to the surveillance records, not to any other activities in Natas. So here is the difference. They're talking about five years limit to show that uh, we're not uh, after nuclear bomb. Uh, and there are uh, people on the other side, they say, no, 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 it has to be over 15 or maybe 20 years. As an expert, do you think five years is enough to prove that Iran is not looking for nuclear bomb? Frankly speaking, I would not put any kind of years. I know uh, diplomats who negotiate this uh, nego uh, agreements, they want to have a clear-cut deadline, you know, when when things happen, but I would put this more performance oriented so that when Iran has demonstrated certain uh, things and IAEA has concluded that, you know, this is okay, then normal activities uh, will resume. So there should be perhaps a grace period, but how long, whether it's a one year, five years or 20 years, I would not put it at this point of time because many things change, you know. Think about the world 20 years from now, or go back 20 years over there, 2011, 2014, 1994, what we had. We were just getting internet. My cell phone didn't fit exactly to my pocket. The world is very different, so it will be 20 years from now. And particularly if you try to put some technical restrictions, you know, they don't really make sense. So I would rather go back to this kind of, you know, uh, process where the uh, IAEA uh, and, uh, conducts and then there are certain conditions set up, what it has to do at, and some kind of milestones. And then whenever the milestone is uh, achieved and IAEA certifies that all nuclear material is in peaceful use, then something can take place if it is still necessary. Because as I said, you know, in who, who wants to have an IR1 centrifuge 20 years from now? Maybe only the Nuclear Energy Museum in Tehran, nothing else, no other place. Yeah. Foreign Minister Zarif was talking about uh, Japan as a model, that Iran is looking forward. It's been said for years that Iran is looking for the model that Japan, uh, Japanese followed. Uh, can Iran become another Japan? Well, I think it, uh, there are a few things Iran has to, uh, you know, change to get there. And it has been a lot, big exercise in Japan. I, I have been following it myself from 1980s. I was even living there for a while in the IAEA office. So, uh, yes, it can be. But, you know, actually the Japanese system is also based on transparency. And earlier in this interview, I made the reference to the white paper. And actually this is what 
Japanese government up updates uh, regularly is that what is their nuclear program, which are the elements, which are the needs, and you know why they need enrichment, even though it's a very small amount at this point of time, compare their needs. And they are all in paper, and then you can look that if there are any activities which are not in conformity with the peaceful uh, use of energy, then you can, nuclear energy, then you can raise the questions. And they have been pretty good in answering. They were the first big country to uh, adopt the additional protocol. It took for a while to, for the IAEA to go through. It took several years to come to this conclusion that uh, all the activities are really and all nuclear materials are in peaceful use, but it was finally done.